Okay, so Mr. Thrive and Survive has a new video out called Lit Moon and Planet Show Sun Should Be Much Larger in Sky. And as is usually the case, I disagree with most everything he says because he's a flat earther and I'm not. But I like to watch his videos and, and I like to watch videos and pay attention to information and news sources that I disagree with more so than what I agree with because when you just surround yourself in a little cocoon of things that you're comfortable with, you don't really learn that way. At any rate, I usually have some questions or comments, but I didn't really say too much in this case. I said, Rich, I could point out how you can calculate exactly how much light the polar areas of the Earth should receive, but I think the response would be met with, we don't want to hear about the standard model. And he responded, sure, we'd love to hear about the standard model. Uh, I'd like to see how the uh, standard model reconciles what we see of 4 minutes, 5 minutes, and 1047. I want to see how 90 degree angles can reach the Earth and Moon and light up both faces fully over a 400,000 plus mile distance and have the angled rays work to produce the umbra moon shadow. Then I'd like to see how both uh, of these can occur and yet the pole has 2.5 months of no light. So sure. So uh, I'll address these questions as, as well as I can. And I'll start off by pointing out there's some things that Rich says that I don't quite understand. Well, I don't understand what he means. For example, here science states suns, the sun's light rays must strike the earth at nearly 90 degrees always. And he says this a lot, uh, this 90 degree angle thing. And I don't understand this at all because, I mean, the way I look at it, you have a light source and an object being illuminated and... Well, you know, the, the light travels from, <laughs> from the light source to the object being illuminated. Uh, so it doesn't really matter what the angle is. And for, and for example, the, 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 the sun isn't, a, isn't like a laser beam or a headlight, right? It's, it illuminates in all directions, so it doesn't matter where an object is. You can have a planet up here or down here or where, wherever, and it's going to be illuminated, right? It doesn't have to be... See what I mean? I, I, I just don't understand this 90 degree angle deal at all. Anyway, I'm going to play a short clip here from Rich's video. And um, you'll see, and I think this also proves that the planets are lights. That's all they are. And uh, well, hopefully everybody will see that. So here we have the uh, yellow lines representing how the sun just perfectly happens to hit the earth so that we have a perfect lunar eclipse. Now I'm going to show the moon here moving into uh, what they call the uh, penumbra. And uh, this is where uh, we go in and uh, this is the dark shadow. When the moon moves into this position here, uh, it's a very dark shadow. Uh, and then we advance it one more time as it gets into this area here. Uh, now that's called the umbra. And because of the crisscrossing of the angles of the sun here, it causes uh, the <laughs> the sunsets and sunrises all over the earth to uh, reflect on the moon. Now there's two problems with that. First of all, um, how is the red of the sunsets, assuming they're red anyway, on the earth, being projected onto the moon? That makes no sense at all. And secondly, it's a shadow. So how is a shadow, how does it turn red? Ask somebody that who believes in this. How do you cast a red shadow? You know, we have people all the time demonstrating, see here, I can take a sphere and I can take a, and you know, they usually take a flat disc and they put it in front of the sphere and say, see, I can cause a shadow to make it look like the moon or like the earth on the moon. I can do that. Well, show me how you make it turn red. But in any case, if we're seeing red shadows on, I mean, red sunrises and sunsets on the earth, that is taking something out of light. That is taking the red spectrum out. You have three basic colors in white light, and that's what the sun is, white light. Three basic colors, red, green, and blue. Now, if you take out one of those colors, you're going to be left with the other two. If you take out red, there should be sort of an aqua color that the moon turns, a greenish blue. Okay, so I'm not sure how best to address Rich's questions, so I'll do my best. Rich's video, uh, Lunar Lunacy, a response to a Flat Earther video, 
is a response to one of your previous videos. Now, I sent you a link, but I didn't cross post a link into the comment section of your video because I thought that might be rude. So you may not have seen this. But um, what I was doing in this diagram is I was calculating the the size of the Earth's shadow that would be projected at a distance, at a lunar distance, okay? So this disk is not meant to represent uh, the moon, but rather the the shadow of the Earth. The moon would be smaller, it would be somewhere inside of this shadow. Now, these cones, this cone is not meant to represent a penumbra or anything like that. I was looking at uh, how the, the nature of the light source is going to determine what kind of shadow the Earth casts. So for example, suppose the sun were just a point source of light right where my cursor is, instead of, instead of the large disk, it's just a point source of light. And if that were the case, then one would expect the shadow to increase the further out you go from, from the Earth. The shadow would be represented by this cone that increases uh, the further out you go. And anywhere inside this cone, uh, the sun, the point source of light sun, would be invisible and you would be in darkness. Now, the sun isn't a point source of light, obviously. It's, it's larger and it's larger than the Earth. So one expects the the shadow cone of the Earth to be more represented by this cone that tapers off the further out you go. All right, so anywhere within this cone behind the Earth, again, if you were, for example, where my cursor is and you were looking in the direction of the sun, you wouldn't be able to see either extremity of the sun. It would be completely uh, blocked and you would be in darkness. Whereas if you were outside of this cone or just outside of the cone, you would see a sliver of the sun, but, you know, just a, just a sliver, okay? So, now again, this, this shadow behind the Earth would be completely black, but that assumes that the Earth has no atmosphere. And whenever I do this sort of thing and I play with this sort of geometry, I usually just negate the Earth's atmosphere because, you know, I'm not exactly an expert in atmospheric optics. Uh, you know, and these atmos the atmosphere just muddles things and makes things more complicated. So, in the absence of an atmosphere, the shadow cone would be black, okay? But the Earth does have an atmosphere, and so some of that atmospheric light that passes around the periphery of the, of the Earth is going to be diffused into, into that cone. And, you know, that's, that's easily understood by just considering ordinary examples I don't know, around the house. Like, if I look under my bed, for example, you know, the area underneath my bed isn't in direct view of any light source. Nevertheless, it's not completely black underneath my bed. There's some light that, that diffuses into, into those regions. And so that's the way that this, this shadow would behave. It would be dark, but, but some light would be diffusing into the shadow from, that passes through the Earth's atmosphere. So then you have to ask, well, what happens to the light as it passes through the atmosphere? And I think you mentioned something about red being filtered out and that the, the moon should be blue or, or something like that. But I think it kind of had that a little bit backwards. Uh, if anything, the, the atmosphere is going to filter out the shorter wavelengths. So... I mean, the atmosphere is pretty, in general, it's pretty transparent to, to the visible spectrum, right? But if you look at the, the full spectrum and you consider the extremities, for example, on the one end, you know, past red and, and infrared, then you have radio waves. And then on the opposite extremity, you have violet and then ultraviolet, right? Well, the atmosphere is pretty transparent to those longer wavelengths, like, like radio. And that's why we can communicate with radio over, over long distances. Whereas on the shorter end of the spectrum, the ultraviolet, fortunately the atmosphere filters out most of the ultraviolet before it reaches the, the surface of the Earth or we would all be dying of skin cancer. And it doesn't do a perfect job, but, you know, it filters out quite a bit of it. So it's actually the shorter wavelengths of the spectrum that are more likely to be filtered out uh, by the atmosphere, the more atmosphere that the light passes through, and the, the light that, that will survive passing through a larger area of, of atmosphere is going to be the, the longer wavelength in, in, the, in the red region of the spectrum. 
and that's why red light ends up being uh, projected into the cone, the shadow cone of the Earth, and and the the moon ends up instead of instead of being invisible, it has a it has a red hue. Now, what's interesting is, suppose we look at an example that behaves in exactly the opposite sense of the Earth's atmosphere or, or air. Okay, so consider, for example, water. Okay. Now, water, like like the Earth's atmosphere, is pretty transparent to the full spectrum, but it's not completely transparent. And if you look at the way it behaves, and light behaves in water, then it's the it's the longer wavelengths that get filtered out by water, not the shorter wavelengths. So, for example, uh, radio waves, which readily pass through the Earth's atmosphere, and we can communicate with radio waves uh, on a daily basis. In the ocean, uh, the radio waves are, are blocked, so a submarine for, is unable to communicate with the surface by radio. Whereas, on the shorter uh, wavelength end, end of the spectrum, and you think of something like ultraviolet, I don't know about you, but I mean, I've I've gone swimming in in the Bahamas, thinking that I'll be immune to uh, to a sunburn, you know, underneath the water, and and. That turned out not to be the case, right? So, ultraviolet passes very readily through through uh, ocean water, and you can get a pretty bad sunburn. So, so the, so water behaves in, in regard to the wavelengths that it absorbs. Water behaves almost exactly the opposite uh, the way the atmosphere behaves, and so you end up with blue light, and the ocean looks blue, and it gets bluer the more water. Uh, the more water that the light has to pass through, and of course, eventually you go down to a deep enough level, and of course, everything gets filtered out at, at depth, and 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 it's just everything is just black. Now, I don't know if you've ever gone to uh, an aquarium, like say, like Ripley's Aquarium, but um, you know, you go to Ripley's and you have uh, and you're walking through these tunnels with with uh, the fish in the in the aquariums all all around you and and up above you and everything, and and you know what? How do the people look as they're walking through the tunnels? Right? They're they're kind of have a blue hue to them, because the red light and the and the and the longer wavelengths are being filtered out by the water, so the water is blue. And in addition to that, the light that passes through is kind of blue hued. And people, you know, within these, within the tunnels, have a kind of a slightly bluish, uh, bluish uh, tint to them. Okay, so like I said, I don't profess to be an expert in atmospheric optics, and that's that's pretty much the extent of my knowledge with regard to color. So I'm going to go back to this lunar lunacy video real quick because. I think it helps to address one of the questions you raised, and that has to do with, uh, I guess, the the angle cast by the the Earth with regard to the shadow, this this umbra shadow. Okay, so it's a pretty acute angle. But what I was doing in this video, I'm going to go forward to the to the calculations, and in this video, I was calculating the size. Of the of the Earth's shadow cast at a lunar distance, and so to do that, I was able to set uh, up a series of uh, uh, triangles, and and just look at a ratio between these two triangles. Now this this angle in this triangle is equal to this angle in this triangle, right? So so they're essentially identical triangles, and because the tangent of an angle is equal to the opposite side divided by the adjacent side, I didn't really have to know or calculate what this angle is. Just knowing that the that the triangles are identical, that means that that this side divided by this side and this triangle is equal to this side divided by this side and this triangle. So that's how I calculated the radius of this shadow. And like I said, I didn't need to actually stop and, and determine what that angle is, but I'm going to go ahead and do that now. And to do that, I'll use these values for for the first from the first triangle, and that is uh, this side is the solar radius minus the Earth radius, and this side is the Sun uh, Earth uh, distance. 
So I'll divide the one by the other, and that will give me the tangent of the angle. So 689, 929, divided by 149, 600, 000. Okay, so that's the tangent of the uh, angle. And then uh, inverse tan is the angle. So that the angle of this triangle is 0 0.26 degrees. So that's a pretty, pretty acute triangle. Okay, 0 0.26 degrees. All right. Okay, so this is going back to your video, and this is later in your video after the 10 minute mark and you were uh, asking the question uh, about the the uh, darkness of the Earth's poles and why is it that the that the poles are able to undergo this period of complete darkness in consideration of these other angles for example the angle that we just calculated which was 0 0.26 degrees now the the tilt of the Earth is what 23.4 degrees and we just calculated that that angle between the, uh, the I guess the edge of the sun and, and, and the uh, edge of the earth is pretty acute. It's like only about 0 0.26 degrees. So 23.4 minus 0 0.26, it doesn't really seem to make, to make a lot of difference. But what I thought I would do is look at this a little bit differently and ask the question, how big would the sun have to be in order to fully illuminate the poles? Okay, so... In other words, suppose that the sun were identical in size to the earth. And if that were the case, and the earth is tilted by 23.4 degrees, and obviously the, the north pole, as shown in this, in this uh, image, the north pole would be in complete darkness. And probably a good size of the, of the polar area would be in complete darkness. And then as the sun is, gets bigger, then the area of complete darkness uh, at the pole would begin to shrink, and at some point in time, the sun would be large enough so that the that the polar area would be fully illuminated even though the earth is tilted by 23.4 degrees and so that's what i've done here i've calculated that <laughs> as you can see the uh the sun would actually have to be quite large in order to fully illuminate the pole uh with the with the tilt of 23.4 degrees it would have to be like a you know 40 million miles in in uh, radius which is which is pretty big. <laughs> okay, so I think I addressed the the uh, questions that, that I'm able to address. I'm going to go back to your video because there's one one last thing here. This is toward the end of your video, and there's, there's one thing that I don't quite get. I'm going to play a little piece here. Now, let's extend this out farther. How far away is Mars? Okay, guys, what I decided to do was just uh, cut it off there. It starts actually getting ridiculous when you start to take out the millions and billions of miles out and how small the sun must be with each one of the planets. And uh, I was actually going to show up, but I think you got the point. Just think of, you know, one of the gas giants, so to speak, uh, Saturn, Jupiter, go all the way out to uh, Uranus and Neptune. Neptune, think about this, Neptune. So... I think this goes back to what you were saying previously about the 90 degree angle thing. And that's what I don't quite understand. I don't really know what you're doing here or why you would think that the sun would have to be, you know, so, so large simply to illuminate uh, Mars because the sun, again, it illuminates in all directions. Uh, in this, in this diagram, the moon could be the sun. All right. And if the moon were the sun, and the light source, it would still illuminate half of the Earth, which it's which is next to it right here, and and it would illuminate half of Mars. It doesn't have to be 90 degrees. So that aspect of your of your video is what I I just have absolutely no idea what you're talking about here. Um, so maybe that's something that you would want to rephrase or or elaborate on or explain in a later video what you mean by by this because I just don't get it. So at any rate, I, I hope I was able to have, to address at least something here to your satisfaction.
Uh, that's uh, that's pretty much the best I can do. So that's that's the extent of my response.